Chris, tell us about the market this week and, you know, the kind of things you were thinking about and maybe even learned, <laughs> right, about what you were seeing. <laughs> well, I learned, again, that no one knows the future, and especially that's true of me. I did see, um, you know, the markets rallied back, uh, retracing so much of what it had lost in uh, the end of February, um, March, and into early April. And um, I thought that the market would be challenged, you know, as it to the upside. You know, most of the times when we see a bear market develop, there's a rapid sell-off followed by a sharp rebound. And that retracement, that rebound, usually is equal to 50%, sometimes as much as 70% of the previous decline. And here we've been at that mark um, for the last week or so, at the 70%, the high water mark of a retracement. And so I expected more challenge to the market averages, but they've so far soldiered on. Um, and uh, that's for the indexes. But, you know, again, this this rally in the market still seems to look past the valley of weak economic activity. And the numbers do look uh, abysmal. But there are some good signs on the other side of this. You know, if we look, if we're close our eyes really hard <laughs> and look to next year, you know, you see cruise line bookings and travel bookings and hotels are showing uh, quite an uptick in activity. Uh, we still don't know if we're going to get there a year from now or if there'll be other delays or second waves or whatever. So we're still really flying in this fog. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty um, surprised by the strength <clears throat> of the indexes. I really am. And I, and I was asking you about this last week and we didn't quite get a chance to finish it. Um, you know, the, the market obviously isn't showing uh, what I think is reality going on in America um, or maybe even globally where, you know, a lot of people are losing jobs and facing, you know, very harsh consequences um, and the market continues to go up. And one of the questions I was trying to ask you is if, you know, above 80% of the market's traded by machines, mm. is this a lack of imagination by the programmers, uh, by the quant programmers that is making the market continue to rally in spite of, you know, the, the most horrific, uh, some of the most horrific events over the last hundred years are happening right now during this pandemic, at least to, to an employment force and to how some people are reacting. Oh, I think absolutely. You know, there are um, many factors, but uh, chief among them is this move toward program trading, computer and algorithmic trading, which, as you mentioned, is on many days, as much as 86% of trading, sometimes even a little higher. Um, so that, to me, is, of course, another form of human herd behavior. Um, and because it's done with lightning speed in computers, it can easily turn just uh, as rapidly. Now, this hasn't happened yet. You know, we haven't uh, well, we did see a couple of brief episodes of this flash crashes um, uh, in 2015, uh, 2010, even when we were kind of in the early stages of this development, earlier stages. Um, and I think the rapid fall in the market, as well as its rapid recovery, um, are indications of how much uh, computer trading is dominating uh, the current trading platforms. But still, behind the programs and the algorithms are are humans who've built these things and um, I just think this is uh, in some ways more volatile and therefore in uh, other ways more dangerous environment because of the rapidity in which change can occur but I also think of course where there's uh, problems there's opportunity where there's challenge and danger there's opportunity so um, I think definitely this uh, market could turn again on a dime and move very rapidly in one direction or the other. Um, it also seems, Neil, that um, there's been a tremendous uptick in small accounts. You know, it seems there's this bifurcation. Um, like you mentioned, the, the market itself seems to be discounting reality. So there's a bifurcation, a uh, 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 spread developing between what's the reality on the ground economically and what the market averages are telling us. I think that's a big one. 
Um, but again, it's driven by many factors, and I think chief among them are these uh, program trades. Um, there's a, a, a bifurcation developing within the market under the hood between so-called smart money, insiders, executives, um, large, hench, large pension funds, um, hedge funds, professional investors, and the uh, retail investors. This, this market rebound seems to be more driven by Robinhood accounts, uh, retail investors at Fidelity and TD Ameritrade. All of them have said that their retail accounts are up anywhere from 100% uh, to 150% in terms of trades executed and number of new accounts opened over the last few months. So there's been a huge rush in retail investors entering the market or believing that they're buying the dip. Um, and again, this is a very interesting feature because for the last 10 years, each time the market has seized up, the central banks around the world, not just the Fed, but other central banks too have come in with a lot of liquidity. This is a little different though, right? Um, it's not just a liquidity issue, but it's a solvency issue. And the Fed can help with liquidity, but they can't help with solvency. With solvency, you've got to have sales. You need revenue, <laughs> right? Fed can't create the revenue. Right. They can temporarily lend you money, but you can't climb out of that well unless you have your own sales to pull you up out of there. That's the real rope, that uh, lifeline that'll get you back onto dry ground. Um, but at least the Fed, and I have to give them credit grudgingly, um, came to the markets very quickly. I mean, this is a unique crisis and we can deal with the fallout and the unintended consequences and all of that, which will come. We can deal with that later. But right now, I think, you know, this was probably the right thing to do, even if it uh, was somewhat haphazard, <laughs> maybe larger than needed, but it gave a signal of confidence to the markets and certainly some liquidity so that for technical reasons, um, we didn't have a wave of defaults and bankruptcies that were greater than we might have otherwise seen. But quickly on that note, you know, we have had, what, I think 24 bankruptcies of uh, publicly traded companies just in the last month or so. Uh, that's really a record number. We had something like 64 last year and 59 in 2018. And just in one month, we had 24. Yeah, it's a very strange thing to watch for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then to see the market rise in the face of that, um, pretty dramatic. And again, you know, the, the, the economy here in the U.S. wasn't really built for a challenge when this all broke out. We were um, <laughs> in your conversation with Jeff when you were talking about uh, not having hardship to sort of uh, give you that solid grounding and recognizing what you could miss. We hadn't had a challenge in this economy in 10 years and we've had it very easy with a lot of support, um, supplemental assistance from the Fed and from other central banks. And I think we were a little bit, uh, in terms of the economy, flabby and out of shape, over leveraged. Um, and, you know, as I'd mentioned to you before, we hadn't seen corporate profits grow since 2014. So we're dealing with really flat profits, but higher stock prices. Um, again, a little more risk. And that's still the case. Um, Charles Gave of Gave Cal Research says the market was 40% overvalued, then it got to about 7% overvalued, and now it's rallied back where it's 34% overvalued <laughs> again <laughs> by their metrics of, you know, price to sales, price to book value, and others. Um, so it still seems that the market indexes certainly are richly priced. You know, it's interesting. I hear um, the economy um, being talked about. Uh, in this V shape, we're going to go down and then, you know, we're going to go up just as fast. And, you know, I, I don't believe in a V shape. Um, I believe in, you know, an inverted L um, that's going, mm -hmm. or maybe just like a letter L, right. It's going to drop. I like the, I like the, uh, the square root image. Yeah, this is gonna the square be, root uh, people talk about where there's a bounce back, but we don't get back of course, to levels pre coronavirus. I think that's certainly likely. And many are still saying um, that it's bullish, that we'll get to within 90% of the pre-coronavirus GDP. But 
that 10% drop is astronomical in terms of recessions. The great financial crisis was a 3.8% drop in GDP. And again, we're carrying higher leverage in this cycle than we have really in many times of human history. So the smallest perturbation means a much bigger ripple effect. Um, <laughs> sometimes size like, well, way, right? You know, just based on the, the guests we've had, it seems like we'll recover just in time to have maybe another potential issue with another potential pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I, I think about a decade of recovery uh, till things are probably back to, say, where they were four months ago or six months ago, right? Um, yeah. It, it'll take a while. You know, what goes up must come down. Um, yeah. It, and when, and when you, you yeah. know, I just think, too, that the, you know, the real challenge is that the Fed's actions, the liquidity that the central banks have provided um, may forestall some bankruptcies. So we're, we're still seeing a lot of them, but I think much of it's been forestalled by the Fed's actions. And again, you can't um, solve a solvency problem with liquidity. Um, so these things still yet have to work themselves out. Uh, um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, more of the mind of a quicker and uh, more intense decline so that we can also enjoy the recovery sooner and get through it. Um, yeah. All recoveries are not, the crashes at the, at the bottom of the crash is always great, right? Cause you know, things are finally going up when, when they start to go up for a few quarters in a row, even if it's slow. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in Howard Marks of Oak tree capital management, always a thoughtful writer. Uh, he <laughs> made the comment that uh, he requoted, he says this wasn't his original thought, but that uh, capitalism without bankruptcy is like Catholicism without hell. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. You need the threat of something, you know, existential to keep you on the right path. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the way we're wired as humans. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, never, yeah. It's really a, a kind of, way. yeah, a, way, a beautiful way of phrasing the moral hazard. Because, you know, even in the last crisis, many of the poor actors didn't suffer the consequences of those actions. Um, they were bailed out. <clears throat> and again, as that happens, um, it means we don't have the corrective action the markets should provide to bad behavior. So, Very, very interesting week in the market for sure. Mm -hmm. Current events. <laughs> Did you see how many antibody tests got pulled by the FDA? <laughs> Did you see the news about the Abbott test? <sighs> it's really amazing. <laughs> and and Moderna, right? They um, yeah. pumped up their test and then had a shelf registration to sell shares. I um, find that behavior abhorrent, of course. That was a classic pump and dump scheme, it seems. And Moderna is a company known, uh, not known to have that sort of reputation, but I guess uh, <laughs> that wasn't uh, really true if you look through it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Neil? What did you see? In in watching Moderna or in, in the antibody tests or just kind of the whole... Well, in uh, generally, in, yeah. in general, you know, there was a company called Predictive Technologies, which is a, a little fly-by-night company here in, uh, I think it's uh, Nevada, maybe. <laughs> and uh, they announced they had an antibody test like three weeks ago, but it seemed a desperate bid to boost their share price. But I wouldn't have expected that from Moderna, right? Um so I, you know, I, but but they're rewarded wrong. So uh, you know, the market isn't set up to reward correctly. I believe and most companies don't set themselves up to reward correct correctly, right? Yeah. Um, most of the CEOs are incentivized on stock price, so you kind of got to do what you got to do to move the stock price because that's what keeps your job in some way. Um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all to watch it, right? And um, some of it became more evident as I, you know, sat on. Uh, a dozen hours worth of calls, you know, listening a lot and nobody being able to tell me heads or tails about, um, you know, where any of the antibody tests were going, right? We, we're, we spent a lot of time looking at different tests and you know, I have my own molecular diagnostics expert I get to talk to daily. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> In Eric Tan and um, to never hear a clear definitive anywhere and you know, I'm asking definitive questions, right? And I, I you know, I, I definitely understand process-driven answers, but 
I'm not hearing process that says, you know, if we do these 27 things in a row, then we're, you know, headed the right direction. So I'm not necessarily even hearing that very well. Um, so, you know, I kind of, and I started to receive lots of calls um, about whether I'd seen anything related to a test. And then that, that told me I should be even more scared, and more wary, right? The fact that people are calling me suddenly <laughs> to talk about it. Um, and then, you know, getting a chance to, to talk to Steve about vaccines and vaccine development over the last, you know, 18 months, Steve Reed. Mm -hmm. um, How often do you get a chance to speak with him, Neil? I, so, you know, there was a time for a couple of years where I was talking to him every few days. Right. Um, and then, you know, in the last uh, five months, as he's really put his heads down and, um, you know, applied for a lot more grants and, you know, hired a bunch more people. Of course, he's been busy scaling out the science effort in his own company. Um, yeah. And, you know, he really started to gain a lot of momentum um, this year. So... Um, it probably started last year sometime um, before a little before Chris from from Thanksgiving, I think it started. So that his momentum really started to to rise. And but talking to him for a long time about it and talking to Frank a little bit about vaccine development, understanding the complexities, you know, and going back to, you know, one of my favorite sayings when I'm looking at development is nine women can't have a baby in one month. So it doesn't matter whether you put, um, you know, all the best geniuses in a room and say, come with the vaccine, you know, the, there's just, there's no replacement for years worth of thought and, and, um, and trial and research. error, right? Yeah. And, and trial and error through the research, mm -hmm. um, and reading about other people's trial and error to come up with, you know, big breakthroughs. So I'm not bearish that a vaccine will come out soon. And I'm going to say under 24 months. Um, but I am bearish on the idea that, um, you know, everybody can suddenly do it, <laughs> right? Like, let's just give Moderna, you know, 468 million. They'll figure it out. They've got right. a bunch of smart guys there. Right. And, and then you know, over I the just... PR newswire comes, you know, nothing in any scientific journal, but just through the public <laughs> relations department <laughs> comes some announcement, which boosts the yeah. share price. It's crazy. Yeah, well, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if things don't show up in in journals all the time. Uh, I, I, that won't. That's not shocking to me. Just you know, you you give anybody a bunch of money and say spend it quickly overnight. You know, uh, okay, yeah, and you know, they're going to be able to take advantage of it in a good way. Yeah, um, yeah. spend it I think, on uh, PR, right? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> well, PR and and more lobbyists. C clearly, something's working. Right. Right. Um, so some, something else is at work there. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, when I when I look at, you know, really COVID mania, um, starting with the, you know, hand sanitizer going crazy on Amazon, or I just got hair clippers, as you saw, my, my terrible pandemic haircut <laughs> <laughs> um, that were delayed by five months. It just kind of told me that, uh, you know, nothing's really going to move at a normal speed and be wary of things that look like they do. Uh, if they haven't shown a, a track record of doing it before. Um, I, it's not that I don't believe, you know, uh, scientists can't be innovative very quickly. I just, I don't believe in like four month results, right? I don't believe in six month right, results. Right, right, right. Right, the idea of science and rigor and a guy like Steve Reed and some of the folks we've invested, a guy like Dirk Vandenboom is that they spent, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it a lifetime yet because they still both have large lives ahead of themselves, but they spent decades, you know, grounding themselves in building things. Um, and that's actually really why I like my sector. You know, I was thinking about that article you sent me on pizza arbitrage and <laughs> Grubhub. Oh, <laughs> fascinating. To figure out, uh, right, right. Yeah, Grubhub trying to figure out a chat. We've got to put this article in the show notes. I sent it to you as well, but uh, Grubhub trying to, uh, you know, but, right. Buy their sales, Door sales Dash. volume. DoorDash and Grubhub Door both, Dash. right? But this yeah. is the DoorDash article, right? About how they were enlisting unwitting businesses um, into their delivery. And, yeah, it, yeah. It, but but it really made me even you know happier. I was a, a life science investor, right? Like we want to look for stuff that's been you know decades decades worth of research, you know, in in fermenting and perfecting um, before it's ready to go to the market. Right. Like that, that's the stuff that really excites me. And well, something that's of real value to humanity and to civilization, not something you're tricking people into <laughs> buying right. first and foremost. Right. Something that has 
lasting value really is uplifting humanity. Or at least that's um, the hope, right? That's where the investment uh, thesis begins. And by the way, if I see that pizza arbitrage opportunity ever, I will call you. We will make, you know, we'll make a quick 50, 100K. I think maybe, you know, <laughs> I was thinking, of, you know, we could do it even on the cheap, um, either partner with existing restaurants or just open a, <laughs> open a couple of fake uh, uh, storefront addresses that are pizza delivery and then just uh, order it all through DoorDash, right? Maybe that's that's what we ought to put our experts to to, to work on to see where, where the arbitrage is and and people trying to buy their markets. Um, yeah, because I like the part where he said at the end he was just putting in uh, uncooked dough in the box. Yeah, right. <laughs> to lower his cost and uh, yeah, buying them through DoorDash at uh, sixteen dollars, and they DoorDash was paying him twenty four dollars a pizza. <clears throat> Phenomenal, right? Phenomenal, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the <laughs> anytime somebody wants to pay you to not do anything this is really a great thing or to, well, I think, I think we'd have one to, through 12 yeah we'd have to put rocks or something in the pizza box to give it a little weight <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we'd have some we'd have some I'm, cost of goods I'm just telling you if I, if I if I see this opportunity I'll be sure to cut you in and we'll do it together <laughs> all right <laughs> startup cost of thirty dollars there's there's your startup idea of the day right. to the other folks <laughs> um, I think that's it I think we can call it an episode yeah thank you Neil it's been great talking yeah. to you and thanks for everyone listening uh, for your time and for your attention thank you very much all opinions expressed by Neil Modi, Chris Idell, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Zoic Capital or Idell Beal and Associates. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.